Can myths be understood on a psychological level? Many scholars have proposed various theories as to the nature and meaning of myths. Myths and folklore appear across cultures and time periods, so clearly they are very important to us, perhaps even intrinsic to the human experience itself. Some scholars propose that myth served as a way for ancient cultures to understand physical processes. Stories of gods that die, only to be reborn again, were important to early agrarian societies, as they were an allegory of how vegetation succumbed to the cold of winter, but returned again in spring. The stories of both Adonis and Persephone fit this theory well. This theory might ring true for the ancients, but it can't explain why stories of gods and goddesses, heroes and monsters, continue to captivate us. After all, we have a much more scientific understanding of the world. We don't need Zeus or Poseidon or Demeter to explain the weather or other natural phenomena. Stories of superheroes, which are the modern equivalent of ancient hero myths, are more popular than ever. So why does myth, folklore, and legend continue to endure today? For Carl Jung, psychology was the key to understanding mythology. A psychoanalyst by profession, the dreams his patients relayed to him eventually led him down the rabbit hole of comparative mythology and religion. He became obsessed with three questions. What is the subject matter of myth? What is the origin of myth? And what is its function? He outright rejected the leading theory of myth when he said that myths are original revelations of the pre-conscious psyche, involuntary statements about unconscious psychic happenings, and anything but allegories of physical processes. To Jung, myths were about the internal world, the world of the mind. The language of myth only used external phenomena as symbolic explanations. The rising and setting of the sun, thunderstorms and floods were all coded explanations of processes that occurred within the mind. To fully understand Jung's psychological theory of myth, we first need to start at his theory of the collective unconscious. All thought can be divided into the conscious and unconscious. At any given moment, we can focus on only a few conscious thoughts, such as what we want to eat for dinner, or how to crush the next big presentation at work. But beneath this upper level of thought lies the iceberg of the unconscious, which contains our underlying aspirations, fears, desires, childhood memories, and much more. Every so often, the hidden thoughts of the unconscious come bubbling up to the surface. Jung found that it was his patient's dreams that most often revealed the hidden wishes of the unconscious. By interpreting dreams, Jung was able to unlock childhood trauma and harmful beliefs that patients harbored toward themselves, often without their conscious awareness that they held those beliefs in the first place. But what intrigued Jung most of all were not the memories of the personal unconscious. Eventually, he would uncover memories from what he called the collective unconscious. Patients relayed dreams that were not, could not, be accounted for by their own personal experiences. Even more interesting was that multiple patients would describe similar events, characters, and symbols from these strange, larger-than-life dreams. A famous example comes from one patient who Jung lovingly calls the Solar Phallus Man. In this man's dream, he saw a phallic tube emanating from the sun, and the movement of this tube is what caused the wind. A strange dream to say the least. But most interestingly, there are records of this exact vision that were experienced by mystics in an ancient Hellenistic religion known as the cult of Mithras, more than 15 centuries prior to the dreams of the solar phallus man. The prevalence of common dreams and visions, not derived from personal, everyday experiences, led to the formation of the collective unconscious theory. Jung believed that all human beings inherited a shared library of images, motifs, and symbols. Through dreams and meditation, everyone has access to the collective unconscious regardless of culture, gender, age, or any other characteristic.
I believe everyone's had a dream like this at least once in their life. Something so strange and fascinating, it's impossible that it could be derived from your own memories or your own experiences. At the same time, the dream feels timeless and important. It sticks with you, like the world is trying to tell you something. To Jung, the myths of the world are produced by those who have had profound encounters with the collective unconscious, so much so that they've committed their experiences to these enduring stories. This explains why there are so many recurring themes, characters, and events, even across cultures and time periods. As the mythologist Joseph Campbell said, myths are public dreams, dreams are private myths. So imagine then, that the collective unconscious is a place, say, a library within the mind, yet shared with all other human minds on Earth. What books does this library contain? The answer is archetypes. In Jung's theory, archetypes inhabit the collective unconscious. These are powerful, fundamental motifs. They can be thought of as universal symbols. They do not depend on anything for their existence. They always were, they have always existed within the human psyche. Myth and storytelling serve only as a way to encounter these archetypes. It can be hard to grasp the concept of union archetypes, so let's identify a few examples. The wise old man is one archetype. We see the wise old man in the biblical Moses or King Solomon, or in more modern times as Professor Dumbledore, Gandalf the Grey, or Obi-Wan Kenobi. The benevolent mother is yet another archetype, and can be seen in the Virgin Mary or the Hindu goddess Parvati, to name a few. Archetypes are not only confined to human characters. Jung subcategorized these as archetypal figures, but there are also archetypal events and archetypal motifs. Archetypal events generally refer to life-changing, human-centric events. Death and rebirth, the coronation of a king, and separation from parents are all examples of archetypal events. Archetypal motifs generally refer to symbols in the natural world that mean something on a psychological level. The world tree, the creation, the flood, the end of days, these are all examples of archetypal motifs. As mentioned, archetypes live within the collective unconscious, independent of any particular personal or cultural interpretation. However, we can never view the archetypes directly. We can only ever see them through a filter. Privately, we see archetypes through dreams and visions, at which point they are subjected to our own interpretations and expectations. Publicly, we see archetypes in myth and folklore, at which point they embody certain cultural values or fears. That is why, although the archetypes are shared, the myths that draw from them can vary widely. It's like the parable of the elephant and the blind man. One man touches the elephant's tusk and says that the creature is hard and sharp like a spear. Another touches its trunk and says it's long and smooth like a snake. The elephant is the archetype, and we are the blind men, its imperfect interpreters. We may be able to grasp aspects of the archetype, but never comprehend it in its entirety. We can see this in two of the most famous instances of the savior archetype, Jesus Christ and the Buddha. They share many similarities. They both renounced the distracting pleasures of the world to deliver a saving message to humankind. But the nature of each savior's message is different. Christ calls his followers to renounce sin, repent, and love and serve God and neighbor. On the other hand, the Buddha preaches that suffering is caused by desire and that the cessation of desire can be reached through the Eightfold Path. So according to Jung's theory, we now understand that the archetypes of this collective unconscious are the origin of myth. But what is the purpose of myth? Why do we as humans tell each other stories using recurring motifs from a shared library of symbols? Is it useful to us in any way? The answer is a resounding yes. To Jung, the unconscious is always trying to impart information and wisdom.
but its attempts at communication are not always recognized or appreciated by the conscious mind. Far too often, we ignore our dreams or innermost thoughts, dismissing them as irrelevant gibberish. The message of the unconscious falls on deaf ears, because we cannot understand its peculiar language of symbols and motifs. On the other hand, myth makes the revelations of the collective unconscious available to most everyone. Because myth is codified into writing and shared throughout the community, we take it more seriously than we do the thoughts confined to our own minds. Within myth, we find guidance to deeply personal psychological questions. In the heroes we identify with, we see examples of compassion and forgiveness, but also of assertiveness and strength. In flood myths, we see how to survive and recover after calamity. Jung believed that frequent encounters with the world of myth was integral in the process of individuation, or the process by which one cultivates a stable personality where the passions, fears, and aspirations are all well regulated within the mind. Through myth, one can confront their own shortcomings and attach themselves to a hero or god that exemplifies the qualities that they wish to develop. In this way, the mythmaker, the creator of myths, performs a vital role in their community. They provide a gateway into the world of myth, which individuals enter to become highly inspired and fulfilled. On a psychological level, a religion is meant to serve its followers by providing the opportunity for encounter with myth. As an example of this, the Catholic Church seeks to bring its adherents into a profound union with the mythic life of Christ. His birth, education, ministry, betrayal, crucifixion, and resurrection. The many facets of his life provide models for one's own personal development. The Mass, the Sacraments, and the Rosary are all the physical tools meant to promote this encounter. But the cultivation of self is not limited to only those who follow a specific religion. In the modern age, we have unparalleled access to all the enduring myths across the world. For the seeker who derives inspiration from Celtic, Germanic, Greek, Hindu, Buddhist, or Chinese mythology, there are seemingly infinite portals into the world of the unconscious. That's all I have for today. If you enjoyed this video, please be sure to leave a like as it really helps promote our videos. Also, consider subscribing and ringing the notification bell so you don't miss any of our future videos. Feel free to reach out to me on YouTube or Instagram to say hi or request a video. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope to see you next time.